Good evening and welcome to The Access. Tonight we'll be discussing the reports of torture conducted by SDF officers, Russia's actions in Syria and the safe zone agreement between the U.S. and Turkey. We will be discussing these issues with our guests, Andrew Gable, research analyst at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, and Bilal Wahab, Wagner Fellow at the Washington Institute. Thank you so much both for joining me today. Um, in this episode, we'll be focusing on the SDF forces. And um, recently, we've seen a video on social media. There's other videos previously to that as well, where there were two members of the SDF forces, apparently in a uniform, torturing um, two people um, covered in blood with a PKK flag in the background. Uh, people were really upset uh, about this and people were talking about it and there's obviously questions about the United States support for um, this group which have succeeded in defeating ISIS but what are the implications when we see this type of video uh, circling around for um, US supported forces like the SDF? Well obviously it makes supporting the SDF politically more difficult um, though my understanding is that the video in question has not been verified, but it mm -hmm. nevertheless shines a light on what has always been a controversial element of the SDF, the YPG, which is the Syrian offshoot of PKK. And the fact remains that the YPG has actually been an essential element militarily in defeating the territory of ISIS, but now uh, the remnants of that force uh, represent a kind of political liability absent reform. And, this affects most of the area that the SDF has liberated um, in the north and the south. Turkey views the presence of the YPG directly on its border as an existential threat. And the presence of YPG elements in Deir Rezor in the south of the country also uh, un underscore and um, exacerbate potential ethnic and cultural and frankly political and administrative tensions in the south of the country as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bilal, what do you comment on this? Um, um, the next challenge, the yeah. next phase of the challenge facing the SDF is, is governance because they have their, their very ex uh, raison d'etre to exist was to fight ISIS and, and Raqqa is liberated, Caliphate is, is defeated. Obviously, you know, the, the, the main goal right now is to make sure that ISIS doesn't have a, a vacuum from which it can reemerge. Mm -hmm. But for SDF in particular, the challenge now is governance. How can they govern over a large swath of territory, the uh, majority of whom is not Kurdish. Uh, so how do they appease the Arab populations? Because in the past it, would, it was easy, in fact, that the SDF controlled areas were safer than ISIS controlled areas and mm -hmm. they were safer than regime controlled areas and they were also safer than uh, rebel group controlled areas. So that was an easier sale uh, for the SDF to do to convince the Arabs to live under Kurdish control. But now that challenge is, is, is gone. And the SDF is, on the one hand, trying very hard to appease the Kurds, to incorporate them into governance. Mm -hmm. Obviously, half of the uh, SDF forces are non-Kurdish. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a, an active effort on the, on the side of the SDF to incorporate the non-Kurds, including Assyrians and Christians, mm -hmm. uh, into uh, the governance structures, the institutions, and the, the Syrian Democratic Forces. But naturally, they're also fighting against a tribal structure that's very conservative, vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis the very left-leaning liberal approach of the, uh, of the YPG. Mm -hmm. Not all of the uh, YPG's policies are going to sink in easily with, uh, with a very tribal Arab population, issues like you know, women participation, mm -hmm. women em empowerment, and mm -hmm. perhaps this opening uh, toward you know, multi-religion, uh, not in the sense of you know, secularism that is uh, uh, distant from religion, but imposed which is, secularism. Which is what PKK is. Uh, in a way, that of, ideology, like, yes. yeah, that ideology may not sit well with with everyone in the SDF-controlled uh, territory. So that's that's the next challenge for the SDF. How do they rule over people and land that are not necessarily espoused to the Kurdish cause? Now, would that result in frictions? I think that's theoretically possible. Friction from both sides, resistance from the Arabic side, resisting the Kurdish control, perhaps the Arabs going, the Kurds going heavy-handed. All of these are theoretically possible. But I think the main point here is that the SDF so far has shown itself and proved itself to be quite pragmatic mm -hmm. and quite um, uh, wise, in fact, mm 
in including, in being inclusive in its governance structure and including and incorporating Arabs into both the state institutions as well as the security forces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the instance such that you raise, uh, from my understanding, is very much, if indeed it happened as it's presented, the exception, not the rule. And it's because mm -hmm. it is the exception, not the rule, that the U.S. felt comfortable partnering with mm -hmm. the SDF in, in the first place. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we are talking about this video um, that was circled around, not verified because it could be done by other parties, uh, including the Assad regime, um, to, to fabricate such a video. But there are, uh, currently, there are arrests and the kidnapping of activists who are working with American organizations. Um, they're working in the civil society movement that is emerging, that is creating a lot of positive things for the stability efforts post-ISIS. Um, and these, their names are, are documented, um, and the SDF is not commenting on that. I mean, obviously, before I started the show, we invited the SDF to uh, people mm -hmm. to come in uh, and, and be part of it. We asked for uh, the State Department to give us a statement on this, none of which have happened yet. Mm -hmm. um, but what about this type of practice when you're arresting civilian activists, not um, you know, allowing them to see their family or to, for their families to know what, their whereabouts or to get lawyers. Why are we seeing this? If you talk about SDF's uh, political tolerance, I think they are least tolerance toward other Kurds. Mm -hmm. For example, the, the NKSA, the, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, the KPP of Syria, mm -hmm. they have been least tolerant uh, against them. Uh, yeah. You know, reporters, activists, political activists that have been complete, like, taken to the border and said, you know, go to Kurdistan where you belong. Yes. Uh, I think, I think uh, to be fair, uh, they've been more tolerant toward Arabs, Assyrians, and Christians, and Armenians than they have been toward, you know, fellow Kurds who don't mm -hmm. necessarily espouse to the YPG model. Mm -hmm. And there's but a history of abuse, th too. Th there's, a, there's a history of, of serious Against disagreements. Kurds, yeah. I think the YPG, the way that they rationalize this is that mm -hmm. they don't want to repeat the experience of the KRG where you had two main political parties with equal military power. Mm -hmm. That was the recipe for a civil war. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, you know, it, it, it's up to, uh, to the listener to buy or... or, or ignore that argument. Mm -hmm. But I think aside from the videos and incidents, and I agree those would be the exceptions and not the rule, uh, there are signs of, of public resentment and discord in the Arab community, not so much in sort of incidents of unverified videos, but in actual public protests uh, by the Arabic community and by some in the Kurdish community mm -hmm. against lack of services and job opportunities against serious issues of governance, mm -hmm. which is, you know, I'll go back to the point that said that I was saying earlier, that the main challenge for SDF moving forward is not so much that I am the force protecting you, the public, mm -hmm. from ISIS, but I'm also here to legitimately rule. Mm -hmm. And I'm able, not only legitimately rule, but I'm also able to rule. Yes. The legitimacy can be der uh, derived from the international support and the defeat of ISIS, mm -hmm. but obviously it's not enough without the ability to provide services and jobs for the public. Yes. What do you comment on this, Andrew, on, on these civilian activists uh, allegation case? Uh, well, I agree with much of mm -hmm. what has been said, and I'd also like to take the opportunity to highlight a few of the kind of the tangible policy pressure points, mm -hmm. particularly in Iraq and Deir Zor, which are area dominated. Mm -hmm. The uh, impressment policy, essentially drafting people into the SDF, the uh, detention policy, there, there is a source of friction between local Arabs who feel that um, their community members have been held too long and, and unfairly, and the SDF would say these are potentially ISIS terrorists mm -hmm. or, or people who have associations with, with ISIS and need to be held. And so these are kind of mm -hmm. at the granular level real points of, of friction to say nothing of the oil revenue. Deir Ezzor is very rich mm -hmm. in oil reserves and mm -hmm. there's a question of who controls that, who who uh, derives the revenue, where does it go? And mm -hmm. so these are all things that need to be worked out, and I think we need to be patient. But what I w want to emphasize is that the U.S. has to be engaged in this process. It's, mm -hmm. it's hard to imagine a situation in which everything takes care of itself if the U.S. withdraws not just its military, but its civilian and stabilization funds, and just everything falls into place. I mean, there's, as has already been said, there will be a power vacuum if the U.S. disengages, yes. and it will s almost certainly be filled by something that's bad for the U.S., um, but also bad for the local Arabs east of the Euphrates and the Kurds, perhaps most of all. Yes. I mean, what could the administration do at this point? What do you think the right approach is to not allowing this type of deterioration of human rights um, situation um, happen, given that this will contribute only in the comeback of ISIS? Well, I mean, I, this is the biggest 
thing is that you know you can't allow this to happen because how would you stabilize a region and create a democratic you know values with respect to human rights um, and not be um, taking a stand on these things happening. Indeed, and the U.S. arguably has the most leverage of anyone in Syria east of the Euphrates River mm -hmm. between its special forces deployments, its international credibility, the U.S. Air Force, the, its ability to enforce the deconfliction line. And so here is where I think the U.S. might have to act as a mediator between some of these uh, local actors who otherwise might not be able to come to an arrangement. But if they know that, if all the actors and all the stakeholders know that they can count on the U.S. long term to plant roots in the region, um, if not militarily, certainly politically, then I think it will help them resolve some of these issues that ultimately do have to be resolved on the local level. Mm -hmm. Bilal, what do you think? I mean, it, it would be engaging Arabs is so important right. in this war. The SDF has a, has a good story to tell, mm -hmm. and they have a very good reputation, and it would be in their interest not to, uh, not to tarnish that with you know, some short-term, maybe anger-driven uh, mm -hmm. reactions here and there. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they are cognizant uh, of that. Mm -hmm. And they realize that, um, you know, public uh, sentiment is very difficult to create and very easy to lose. So um, the, 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 the question of response. economic viability, okay. mm -hmm. the question of economic viability, I think, is going to be the next big thing for the SDF mm -hmm. um, because um, they're really resource poor. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, mm -hmm. yes, they do have some oil, and that oil is still being sold to the regime, to the Assad regime, mm -hmm. in part because the Kurdish area in, in Syria is impoverished, impoverished in the sense of uh, lacking any industry. Mm -hmm. So they don't have any refining capacity, they don't have any petrochemical mm -hmm. uh, plants. So the raw material has to be sold to uh, you know, Aleppo and to mm -hmm. Damascus, and that is where the, uh, the Syrian industry heartland has and been. And that's another problem, I think, uh, sure, because uh, that, there are sanctions a, against it, uh, that's exactly shape. right. And, and that's also true for agriculture. Uh, yes. The agribusiness is very weak because, mm -hmm. again, the area has not been developed. It was part of the Assad regime of making sure that the Kurdish areas and the Kurdish people remain you know, marginalized and sidelined. And therefore, part of that was that to make it an economic backwater. Mm -hmm. So that's a challenge for SDF because they start from a very low point on, on, on one hand. On the other, it's not like they're starting from zero. They're starting from minus because mm -hmm. of the war mm -hmm. and the impact of the war. But also, I think another hindrance that the SDF will have to eventually grapple with is their own economic ideology. This, uh, you know, if, if you want to look at the traces of, of PKK in the YPG, that would be the ideology. And Ojalanism, I think, is a hindrance in their ability to attract foreign investors, mm -hmm. to promote local business, create banks, which they still don't have uh, clear answers to. And I think those would be the big strategic questions for the SDF if their goal is to make sure that they will be governing these territories and these people uh, in the long run. Now, if these videos and these stories and anecdotes are true, obviously they're not in the right direction. They're not heading in the right direction, if that is true. Um, in terms of by cutting the regime, I mean, that's a very important uh, thing that we're, we're uh, you know, hearing the administration asking um, and actually sanctioning people who uh, try to uh, smuggle oil to the Assad regime. If you're saying this is continuing, um, what could the administration do to stop these activities? Who is the other potential market for this oil to be sold to and, and providing alternatives for these areas also to have the money and the income to uh, survive? Well, obviously, uh, the, hopefully the, thrive, but, the yeah. easiest market would be Turkey, mm -hmm. uh, if Turkey were, were willing to buy. Now, yes. of course, smugglers operate in these borders. You know, if there are people who are truly, uh, you know, globalists and they don't believe in these borders, those would be the smugglers. But obviously, uh, in that part of the world, it's very difficult to distinguish between organized crime, terrorism, mm -hmm. and corrupt officials, mm -hmm. who chances are they're all part of one network or one, as one academic calls, um, uh, a, uh, a dirty entanglement of different actors in which come together and therefore contribute to the cycle of violence and, and instability. So the oil finds its way out. The question mm -hmm. is, who buys it and how much benefit does it bring back to, uh, to uh, you know, eastern uh, Euphrates, to Rojava? Mm -hmm. uh, if the relations were any better, then Turkey would obviously be the clear, the obvious mm -hmm. market. The second uh, most uh, probably amenable market would be the KRG. And yes, mm -hmm. some of some of Rojava's oil does find its way to uh, to the KRG, you know, mm -hmm. used for refining, or perhaps uh, finds its way back into Turkey, ironically through yes. the Kurdish pipeline. 
Oil is a very fungible product. It finds yeah. its way to the markets as long as there are buyers. And of course, much of it also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, ends up in, in Assad-run uh, refineries. Mm -hmm. But that's just by necessity because uh, they need the fuel, they need the mm -hmm. electricity. There is a symbiotic relationship, economically speaking, at yeah. least. That's the Between Rojava, definitely needs that. Yeah. Definitely. They, they have, have the, the Yeah, exactly. They have the refineries, not the raw material and then vice versa for the SDF. And that relationship, even the U.S. hasn't been able to cut, and the SDF, the Kurds themselves, have also used that as kind of a, uh, kind of a foot in the door mm -hmm. if they need to eventually make peace with the, uh, with the Assad regime or come to some sort of a, of a term with them. Uh, sometimes they get closer, the U.S. warns them off. Sometimes the U.S. for a while was encouraging that relationship. All of that, I think, depends on what is going to happen with a safe zone, if that is going to become a de-conflicting mechanism between, in, in the relationship between Turkey, yes. SDF, and the regime. All and that, we will talk we about that, yes. That. We'll, yes. Get, we'll talk and, more about that. And if I could this. just yes, speak please, briefly on the oil, here's where the U.S. could actually take a direct role. Mm -hmm. um, the area now controlled by the SDF it holds over 90s, by some estimates, 95 percent of Syria's remaining oil, most of it in Deir ez mm -hmm. But much of the oil fields haven't been updated. They don't have the most modern technology. They don't have mm -hmm. indigenous refining capacity. Mm -hmm. If the U.S. and perhaps a combination of the U.S. and its coalition partners were to help the East become more sufficient, more efficient in production, develop a domestic or internal refining capacity exclusive in the East, it would have a couple of really beneficial, um, it, would, it would create a situation that would redound to the U.S. and its partners. Mm -hmm. For one, it would uh, allow them to, uh, it would allow the East to develop more economic self-sufficiency, which, I mean, if you're trying to bring Assad back to the negotiating mm -hmm. table is vital. Mm -hmm. um, show Assad that, you know, the East actually doesn't need you. And so if you were trying mm -hmm. to negotiate politically, you better actually offer something instead of uh, rejecting up front the notion of free and fair elections and, and a new constitution. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it would signal to friend and foe alike in Syria that the U.S. intends to be there for the mm -hmm. long run, if not with a heavy ground presence, certainly politically and economically. And I think this would bolster U.S. credibility and give it more bargaining power when mm -hmm. it tries to mediate some of the conflicts we've touched upon earlier. Mm -hmm. Ambassador James Jeffrey on uh, my show uh, just last week said that uh, basically, uh, the administration and the President Trump is clear that they want to keep a minimum number of American forces for an indefinite time. Uh, but on the ground, in terms of supporting civil society, um, kind of enforcing these laws, monitoring uh, the military uh, situation and who is armed and, and, and uh, how organized this situation is, uh, not seeing the Ojlan picture, <laughs> maybe. Um, it's things like that. How involved is the U.S. in all of this ongoing stabilization effort? Because that's the big question, stabilization after the defeat of ISIS and ensuring that there's no vacuum. It, it's, it's very difficult to convince Kurdish fighters to, uh, you know, abandon Ojalan and Ojalan's mm -hmm. image. I mean, let's not... Uh, sort of kid ourselves. These mm -hmm. these guys are in it so zealously because they believe in an ideology, they ideology. believe in a mission, they believe in an icon, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a in a in a figure, mm -hmm. and that figure is Ojalan. And yes, maybe when when some Americans are present, they can remove it, but when they're gone, they put it back on. Uh -huh. That is who they are. Uh, yes. But that does not necessarily mean that they take every order from Kandil or from PKK mm -hmm. leadership, mm -hmm. because there is little that uh, the PKK military. Mm -hmm leadership in the Qandil Mountains can offer, uh, you know, the, the Syrian Democratic Forces or the, the, the administrative government in northeastern Syria about uh, the local elections or mm -hmm. how to clean the sewers and the streets and, you know, where to build the school. Mm -hmm. Those decisions have to be made by the local authorities. Mm -hmm. And that is actually where uh, a level of political autonomy from Qandil is developing and brewing in, in, in Syria, mm -hmm. where the kind of needs and demands that they have, uh, the kind of questions that they have, are not necessarily answered by, uh, uh, by Qandil and by the PKK. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where the U.S. Uh, you know, would invest or mm -hmm. should invest in order to create more autonomy, more capacity uh, at governance, uh, and also the credibility and the, the legitimacy for, um, uh, for, for, for governing the, the non-Kurds. Because, you know, Ojana ideology, the Kurdish nationalism can only go so far.
Yes, in a, in a mixed area. And just briefly area. on the SDF, there are also plans to stand up and expand upon regional and local uh, security elements mm -hmm. as well. So you don't necessarily have an Ojalanis in Deir Ezzor pointing a gun at the local you know, tribe's chief mm -hmm. on a security mission. A lot the idea is you roll a lot of these responsibilities to local trusted, mm -hmm. uh, basically law enforcement mm -hmm. uh, elements. And so you have Arabs in Deir Ezzor responsible for security over Deir Ezzor and mm -hmm. Raqqa and so forth. And I think yes, if localized authority, localized authority, mm -hmm. localized law enforcement, mm -hmm. localized counterterrorism to the extent possible, uh, and. If that, in fact, happens, which is the plan, um, then I think this will serve to diffuse some of the, the tensions and the pressure points that can undermine the whole project. And I would say that a, a very, very small contingent of the U.S., if it's supported by American air power, probably is able to deter action by Russia, Iran, Assad, and crossing the Euphrates and taking back al Tanf, which is west of the Euphrates. Uh, but the idea of long-term stabilization, building domestic counter-terrorism capacity, mm -hmm. that might require more troops than simply a state-on-state, -state, even through proxy conflict. And so mm -hmm. I think the U.S., before it, it pulls more troops out, might do well to really um, have a, a serious conversation about what it's tr trying to achieve on multiple security fronts, uh, and then figure out how many U.S. troops it takes to, f to uh, substantiate that mission. And if it means putting a few more in, it means putting a few, few more in. No one's talking about Iraq war level mm -hmm. troops, yes. but even at the margin, um, U.S. expertise, especially if it's in the special operations, special forces vein, uh, could really take a lot of pressure off, off uh, an SDF that in some areas is very overstressed, particularly in some of these refugee camps where ISIS ideology is starting to reemerge. Yes, and we're going to be talking about this point as well, but you know, because we saw success in the American push. Uh, against any negotiations between the SDF and the Assad regime. The Assad regime was trying to do that. We saw a beginning of that, but then it failed. The efforts failed because the United States reassured that they're going to stay there. They, they stood against any type of negotiations. And that's the main fear, is that the winner of any type of deterioration in the situation in the SDF force control area or between the American um, and the American presence basically being um, even weaker or, or more withdrawn mm -hmm. is only going to be benefiting Assad and Iran on the ground. And potentially ISIS as well. I mean, pick yes. your poison. Yes. It's, it's not yes. either or. And everyone, and I mean, the point All is... All of the bad players are going to be benefiting. Yeah, and as complicated as U.S. capacity building missions are, mm -hmm. even at a very, very small scale, I would, I would just encourage skeptics to look at every conceivable alternative and every mm -hmm. single one is in my estimation uh, orders of magnitude worse. We will be right back after a quick commercial break. We are back with our guest for tonight's episode, Andrew Gable, Research Analyst at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, and Bilal Wahab, Wagner Fellow at the Washington Institute. Is autonomy uh, uh, an option for, for, the, for the SDF? Because we know that before the PYG, the PKK uh, branch, were against autonomy. Mm -hmm. They were more like, oh, you know, let's have like a self-rule, but still be connected to the Assad regime. And this is, like I said, the, the main fear is that mm -hmm. having this type of reconciliation with the Assad uh, regime, people are asking for more independence, complete independence, um, uh, under a federal... Uh, system, mm -hmm. but with no engagement and, and direct contact with the Assad regime. In your opinion, I mean, after today, knowing that the SDF has been getting uh, support from the United States, which is ideologically, if we've talked about the PKK, they're not very mm -hmm. aligned with the West in general. Uh, but is that changing, in your opinion, inside of the SDF? Or how much is, uh, how powerful are the PKK related elements within the SDF today? In your opinion, that's a that's a, a complex question. Yes, um, the SDF goals, the the, the PYD goals, mm -hmm. are to save and safeguard what they have established, mm -hmm. which is the first effort at self governance. Mm -hmm. uh, and on one hand, you know, again, the Kurds were not 
uh, were oppressed under the Assad regime. Let's be very clear about mm -hmm. that. They were stateless. They were not citizens. They were not equal. Those who were citizens, they were not equal citizens with the Arabs. As I mentioned earlier, the Kurdish areas were were a backwater in Syria. The regime intentionally indulged in demographic changes. Intentionally uh, made sure that you know industries uh, are, are are not developing in these areas. They remain. Yeah poor, etc. Yes. So that is where it starts. So this is a, an opportunity for the Kurds to change that. Mm -hmm. And that's one. But there's also another opportunity, and this is where the ideology comes in, to experiment with implementing some of Ojalan's ideas mm -hmm. about governance. Mm -hmm. And they really want a shot at that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I'm, I'm quite uh, impressed that they have managed to be pragmatic when it comes to you know, changing the names from Rojava to, uh, to you know, uh, autonomous government, mm -hmm. uh, Kurdish names to more inclusive names, SDF, mm -hmm. you know, doesn't have the word Kurd in it. Yes. So they have been pragmatic in sort of changing the, the names and changing the shape just to be accommodating. And the yes. fact that they went to Raqqa and now they realize that the majority of the people that they rule, it's not KRG, it's not Iraqi Kurdistan. You don't have a homogenous uh, society. Kurdish, yes. It's not homogeneously Kurdish, yes. that's one. And two, unlike Iraqi Kurds, they don't have the proverb of no friends but the mountains because they don't have mountains to run into. Yes. So that has forced them into being more amenable, mm -hmm. into being pragmatic, into changing their attitudes, changing their ideas, changing their alliances, going from, from being the uh, you know, very hard line against uh, Assad into actually opening up to negotiations with Assad. Mm -hmm. Now, the American presence could be... Do you think be... they were originally hardline against Assad? Well, the... Okay. Not the PYD. <laughs> Um, the Kurds, yes. The Kurds, yes. Not necessarily the PYD. Yes, I take okay. your point. Okay. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, and then that's where the, the differences yes, that I, the difference. I alluded to earlier comes yeah. within, like the friction within the Kurdish community, mm -hmm. because the PYD is seen as as having always had some level of warm relations with the Assad regime. Yes. Now, have, but there were also skirmishes between the YPG and the Assad regime. They really killed from each other. Yes. There, there were fights. There was also there so was fights. Yes. Exactly. This is not a uniform relationship. Mm -hmm. So this is what they try to safeguard. Now, the American presence, on the one hand, empowers this to be. It protects them from a Turkish incursion. It, uh, it protects them, perhaps, from a Syrian incursion. And it has also provided some counterbalance with Russia, because Russia wants a weak SDF, a weak Kurdish group, mm -hmm. to therefore fall back under Assad's um, uh, regime and Assad's mm -hmm. control. The United States does not want that. Even if the U.S., for, some, for, for a time, was entertaining negotiations between SDF and the Assad regime, but it didn't want a weak Kurd to negotiate a settlement with the Assad regime, but they wanted the SDF to negotiate, even if to negotiate, from a, a point of strength. Mm -hmm. And that strength means some safety from Turkey mm -hmm. and some economic uh, um, standing, mm -hmm. but also some greater legitimacy being ISIS on, on the ground. I, I agree with, with Andrew that I don't think the U.S. You know, political commitment is going to be there forever because that mm -hmm. will ultimately mean the division of the country. And that's not U.S. policy to divide mm -hmm. Syria. The Kurds realize that, so they have never called for an independent Kurdistan. Mm -hmm. They always talk about you know, more rights within Syria. The integrity of Syria is still something that the SDF uh, mm -hmm. you know, espouses. But how much can they gain and how much can they get? Back to your second question about how much PKK influence is still there. The yes. ideological influence is definitely there. The allegiance to Ojalan mm -hmm. as, as a symbol is there. Uh, perhaps the PKK um, say in the military affairs is still significant. Mm -hmm. But as the military role of SDF takes a, a step back and the governance, the economic, the, the, the accommodating challenge uh, of, of ruling people and ruling territory becomes more important for the SDF, for the uh, PYD, the main political party there, I think PKK in the mountains have less and less say and have mm -hmm. less and less influence on them because simply that's not their area of strength. Yes. And therefore, whatever ideology that they read in Ojedana's book, that is where the, 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 the rubber the uh, hits the road. Yes. Yeah. That is when they have to practice with this. And if it doesn't work and there are protests on the street, the, the SDF has to choose between uh, appeasing uh, a protest on the street or going back to Ojalan's book. And yeah. so far they have proven to be quite pragmatic in actually listening to uh, the noises from the street. Mm -hmm. What uh, do you I think, think yeah. One critical point that what is allowing the SDF to subsist in the way it currently is east mm -hmm. of the Euphrates River, it's the presence of the U.S., military, mm -hmm. economically, politically. And so mm -hmm. I think it'd be helpful to review the goals of the U.S. in this conflict. Mm -hmm. And they've been made explicit multiple times, um, and they're very clear. 
enduring defeat of ISIS and Al Qaeda affiliates, removal of Iran ground troops mm -hmm. and proxy forces, mm -hmm. um, and a democratic or reform process in accordance with the UN Security Council Resolution 2254, mm -hmm. which includes free and open elections and a new constitution. Mm -hmm. So far, as the regime in Damascus has shown no interest in, forget all three, mm -hmm. even making meaningful progress on one of those objectives. And so even if long term the US in a perfect world would like to pull out the six and go home, functionally, if it follows through on its commitment to those goals, it's going to be in eastern Syria in some dimension for mm -hmm. the foreseeable future. And, and here's where I think that um, even though nominally we can be for an, a, a complete end to the conflict that has total reconciliation, where Assad allows free and fair elections and there's a new constitution mm -hmm. and everyone lives hap, 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 you know, happily ever after, I think functionally that's very unlikely. Mm -hmm. And that if the U.S. helps foster economic independence and helps mend some of these political fissures that have, have opened up in the SDF areas in Deir Ezzor and Raqqa, um, you could functionally have an east of Syria, east of the Euphrates, mm -hmm. that for all intents and purposes, and this is just my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, functions as an autonomous region. And yes. so what that does is it sets up a fairly favorable arrangement by which it either continues to grow and govern as an autonomous region, mm -hmm. or Assad realizes that if he wants to fold this area back into a regime, he actually has to make meaningful reform. And so you either have a status quo that can, continues to become more favorable because mm -hmm. you're every, with every passing year one, one's more independent and self-sufficient, mm -hmm. um, or one finally compels Assad to get serious. A mm -hmm. And so this is where I think the U.S. would really benefit from staying focused on those three objectives and an on-the-ground policy perspective following them through to their logical end. Um, my question would be about accountability. I mean, is, has there been uh, other experiments by the American uh, government when there was interference in other countries where there is, um, you know, ongoing civil war, um, a situation where there's a, a fear of uh, the reemergence of terrorism, um, have created a measurement of accountability where you do not allow these same, uh, basically, quote unquote, causes or um, grievances of these societies to go back and fall into the hands of extremists or, or have this kind of uh, um, good or fertile ground for uh, extremism to grow, which we have seen happening now in eastern Iraq and in some uh, parts of the Badia in Syria, the desert part of Syria. So what is the accountability measurement that the administration or the American government can impose in to order to prevent or to decrease the danger of having these type of terrorist cells reemerging. I'll go back to actually Andrew's last point. Mm -hmm. you know, keep keep your eye on the prize. Those are the three main goals. Those are actionable, mm -hmm. achievable objectives uh, for the United States. And the name of the game is not control. The name mm -hmm. of the game is influence, mm -hmm. uh, accountability. The, ultimately, the character, the agency that's accountable is going to be the SDF. Is going to be the administrative. Uh, government of uh, of northeastern Syria or Rava, and how could and they be the accountable States? against them? I mean, how could they be held accountable if they if they abuse um, people from different? Back I mean, you know, how could they be held accountable too in a way that they are not creating and driving that wedge to happen again between Arabs and Kurds and uh, having the Arabs feel marginalized? And the way they felt. They haven't, they haven't. Even I mean, under the Assad You're regime. talking about the SDF, you mean? How, how can yes. the SDF be accountable? Yes. Well, can uh, the American uh, help in, in creating that accountability system? I mean, did that happen in Kurdistan, Iraq? The question of accountability is a, is a, is a, is a tough nut to crack because mm -hmm. uh, in a place like Iraqi Kurdistan that you referred to, their power is established. Mm -hmm. Two political parties, they have been in power for 25 years, they have the wherewithals, institutional, economic, and military to be in power and stay in power and therefore rule. Mm -hmm. That is not still the case in, in Syria. You know, no one is sure about where they are today, where they were yesterday, where they're going to be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Which means, on the other hand, that people are therefore more uh, attuned to the public, a protest in Rojava, in Qamishli, or in Kobani is going to be is going to matter a lot more than a protest in Erbil. Yes. Uh, why? Because the the YPG, the PYD in Syria, is not as stable 
and the roots of government and power are not as stable as those of the KDP and the PUK and in, mm -hmm. in the KRG, to, to draw to your analogy. So but what that means is, therefore, they have to continue this, this practice of pragmatism and, you know, one step forward, probably two step backwards, or maybe, uh, you know, two forward and one backward. But th that's why I go back to the question of ideology and originalism and how much useful that's going to be, because while they have committed to the aura and the persona of Ojalan, they have also proved pragmatic about ditching some of the ideologies that they have been, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, bottle-fed or breastfed mm -hmm. in to respond to the realities on the ground. Mm -hmm. And as long as they continue that, with the U.S. pressure and the U.S. encouragement yes. and the U.S. guidance, I think there is, there is positive outlook for them. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, can that go wrong? Yes, because believe it or not, uh, as many you know, uh, people in, in, in the Iraqi community will, will tell you, defeating an enemy turns out to be easier than uh, appeasing the, the, the population. In other words, the security challenges tend to be easier mm -hmm. to the long-term challenges of governance. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, the real, the real uh, test for the SDF is you know, longevity as the power ruling this area of, of mm -hmm. Syria. Yeah, and I would say in a way, it, it's, it was easier and less resource intensive mm -hmm. to simply recapture territory. I mean, the U.S. has total air superiority. Exactly. In the East, mm -hmm. you, can roll, you can roll forces very quickly. Holding that territory, being, uh, building meaningful localized security apparatuses, mm -hmm. making sure that there aren't marginalized parties, this is much more complicated, mm -hmm. and I think it requires patience uh, and, and engagement and, invest, and potentially I investment one way or the other. And I just think I want to reemphasize how important I think it is to reform the partner security structure such that it's not simply SDF over everything and that's it, uh, that a lot of the day-to-day -day security is handled town by town, locality by lo locality, region by region. And though I think it's very important... With the democratic maybe sensitivity to yes, who yes. is a, 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 a federalized structure that not just political, that's mm -hmm. military and security. Mm -hmm. um, so so you know, Kur Kurds are, are responsible for security in Kurdish areas, Arabs are responsible for Arab areas. Mm -hmm. and, and the U.S. also, to that point, yes. the U.S. has better experience in helping uh, you know, their, its partners defeat enemies than uh, be accountable to their population, to their mm -hmm. public. You know, you're absolutely right. It's it's easier to help uh, an, an active, powerful force than that, like the SDF to go and liberate Raqqa. Mm -hmm. I mean, easier as in the U.S. has the tools for that mm -hmm. and has the experience and the expedience and also the patience mm -hmm. to see that through. Mm -hmm. Now, do they have the same patience and experience and tools to... Uh, liberalize the economy, mm -hmm. to see through that uh, the institutions are strong and accountable, mm -hmm. that there is transparency in the, in the administration. I mean, nation building is a taboo word in this, uh, in this town nowadays. Yes. So fight ISIS, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, create good governance and good institutions and accountability. No one has stomach for that, unfortunately. Yes, yeah, so. nobody, exactly. And there's no experience in, in creating that in, in previous uh, times. What about the reemergence of ISIS um, that we just mentioned? This is very important because it yes. is happening. So the war yeah. to defeat ISIS is not over yet. Not Absolute, to mention the yes, stabilization absolutely, effort. Absolutely correct. Uh, and this actually segues perfectly because mm -hmm. um, I think one of the elements in making sure that ISIS doesn't reemerge ideologically, that it doesn't elicit sympathy in areas mm -hmm. like Deir Azor and Raqqa, mm -hmm. is making sure that the local populations don't feel that they've replaced and it's very, very unfair to, to compare ISIS and SDA. I'm not, I'm not yes. in any way mm -hmm. suggesting that they're the same. Yes. But the point is that there's local resentment towards a force responsible for security that mm -hmm. is perceived as being outside and inappropriate. That could foster certain resentments and sympathies that are then mm -hmm. exploited, not just by ISIS, but by other outside powers, the Assad regime, Iran, and Russia. And so part of the... the critical reforms that I think need to take place in the SCF and security are not just about making people feel better. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really directly addressing resentments that will be used, inflamed, and exploited by ISIS. And, and let's not forget, even though ISIS as a territorial entity has been vanquished, mm -hmm. there are estimated between 14 and 18,000 ISIS fighters today between Syria and Iraq. They have, they're gaining a, a lot of uh, sway in some of these refugee camps. And so we can't take our eye off the ball and we can't again assume mm -hmm. that because the territory on a map is now shaded differently, mm -hmm. there aren't a lot of really dangerous people who want to frankly do the United States um, and the project in Syria great harm. Yes. What do you think? I mean, what's your comment um, on I, that? I, I agree and I would just add that, um, you know, the point that I made earlier about how the U.S. has better experience and capacity at defeating enemies mm -hmm. 
whether directly, you know, doing mm -hmm. it itself or doing it through partners, uh, then, then the patience that it takes to uh, make sure that they don't re-emerge. I mean, yes. you know, that's the story of Iraq, right? Yes. Al-Qaeda is defeated, uh, the surge is working, the society is coming back together, the polity is, is taking shape, and that is when basically a little investment from the U.S. is going to go a long way. Yes. But that's where the question of patience comes in. But and the then U.S. Obama is too eager to and leave. Pulled out. And you go out, you pull out, <laughs> right. and then ISIS comes, comes, uh, yes. uh, takes over, and then you yeah. go back and you defeat them. So now the question is, you know, goes both ways. Mm -hmm. You say, all right, let's not repeat the the, the mistake of 2011. Mm -hmm. Let's remain engaged. Let's make sure that the government is, as you mentioned, accountable, yes. legitimate. Let's make sure that the economy, you know, is mm. is up and running. Let's make sure that services are up and running. Let's sh make sure that you know there is there are, there are the institutions in place for social harmony to move forward. Yes, there is that attitude, which I think we both you know kind of ring along those uh, those tunes. Mm -hmm. But there is also, unfortunately, the attitude of. We don't do governance right. Mm -hmm. We don't do nation building right. We don't do stabilization right. So, but we do, you know, terrorism defeating right. So, if terrorism reemerges again, we're going to go back, and we're going to yes. do it again. So, to me, that is very costly. And remember that ISIS was deadlier, more brutal, and also stronger than Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. So, if we adopt that approach, who knows what you know, ISIS 2.0, uh, as, as the saying like. goes. Or whatever Frankenstein is going to emerge in the future is going exactly. to look like. And we know that there's three major parties, including ISIS, and uh, not actually uh, ISIS added to it, uh, that are hoping for the American withdrawal from Syria, for the weakening right. of the SDF. Uh, they want this project to fail. And those are the Assad regime, Iran, and Russia. You mentioned that Russia wants a weak SDF, but also the Assad regime in Iran would love to see American pull out. Mm -hmm. SDF and maybe the PKK element taken over, what could they do to maybe try to expedite that or to influence this type of shifting dynamic in, in these regions? I mean, what, could, what should people be on the lookout to in terms of that really dangerous possibility of not having the American presence continued in this area where it's blocking the Iranian corridor? Uh, to Syria. I mean, this is another element that we're not talking about right. today. Right. ISIS and Iran have one thing in common. Mm -hmm. They're excellent at filling vacuums. Mm -hmm. So the answer is easy. Don't create vacuums. Don't allow for vacuums to mm -hmm. emerge. You know, there's a vacuum in Iraq. Uh, there were vacuums in Iraq filled either by ISIS or by Iran. So I think the, the lesson for Syria is similar. Uh, make sure that there are no vacuums. And I'm very happy that you know, when there was a push for the withdrawal of U.S. forces, I think the more rational elements in the administration and the government kind of pushed back against that, including the military itself, mm -hmm. pushed back against that, that creating a vacuum is only going to help either Iran or ISIS, none of which is going to be in U.S. interest. So the persistence of U.S. presence and aid uh, is helpful in that direction. Mm -hmm. But obviously that's not going to be forever, mm -hmm. right? So building a partner that can stand on its feet is going to be very important. And the SDF also knows that ultimately there has to be some sort of a deal with the Assad regime because mm -hmm. Assad is, is, is unfortunately winning mm -hmm. and uh, uh, he is rebuilding. Yes, he is rebuilding a relationship with though. the Arab countries. Uh -huh. I mean, mm -hmm. he's been winning on the ground militarily mm -hmm. and he is rebuilding a relationship with the Arab countries because mm -hmm. they're sort of dealing with the new reality. So the but SDF the administration sees stopped that as that well. Too. I mean, we saw some, some talks about some Arab countries wanting to, to create that relationship and the administration basically told them to stop. Right, so, but Assad is not going anywhere anytime mm -hmm, soon, mm -hmm. and that's my main point. Mm -hmm. And the SDF, as I mean, SDF is not Egypt, is not mm -hmm. Jordan. If Jordan and Egypt are rebuilding relationships with uh, with Damascus, mm -hmm. why should the SDF break that relation with Damascus? So mm -hmm. they know that. But as long as the Americans are there, they're not going to go full they hearted with the uh, with, uh, with the with the regime. Mm -hmm. So some clarity in that in that the nature of the relationship is also going to be important down in, in the strategic term in the long term, especially the, yeah. the expectations. I'm going to let you answer that, Andrew, that even if, the, let's say, this relationship does happen, if the United States does pull out, uh, that will be on the expense of the SDF. I mean, you're no longer going to be seen. It's going to be the, the fragmentation of whatever the American uh, government has helped build to counter ISIS. It's not going to be the same uh, SDF that the Assad regime is trying to respect. They're going to, you know, 
um, basically destroy it if possible because they want to take over these areas in the oil. Precisely. Um, and many, frankly, of the leadership may very well find themselves in, in the hands of the Mecha Barat and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so the stakes are very high. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I couldn't agree more that if I'm Russia, Iran, or Assad, what I want to do is I want to split the SDF and the U.S. I want the U.S. out of there mm -hmm. to leave the SDF isolated without air power, without U.S. political credibility, and over time grind them down to a pulp. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to split the SDF from the Arabs in Raqqa and Deir Ezzor. And so in terms of what to look for, I would look for attempts by any and perhaps all of those parties to drive wedges between Arabs in Raqqa and Deir Ezzor and the SDF between the SDF and the U.S. And so to bring this full circle from the beginning of our discussion, um, whether or not the video that you, you referenced about the purported abuses are, are real or not, these are the kind of news events that make it more difficult politically for the U.S. to sustain its support of the SDF and to sustain its presence in Syria. And so on one hand, I mean, be very skeptical and, and, and um, be sure to front look for all the evidence in these kind of uh, instances, but on the other hand, from the perspective of the SDF, it means the SDF should be very careful and prudent and judicial with how it conducts itself, because the, if the president is already unconvinced of the long-term viability of the mission, anything that makes it more politically dangerous, that makes it more difficult to sustain, is ultimately going to redound to the benefit of America's enemies in the region, Assad, mm -hmm. Russia, and Iran. Uh, lastly, I want to touch on Turkey. That's important because now we know that there's an, uh, the safe zone mm -hmm. that has uh, been created with the administration and the uh, Turkish government. There was the withdrawal of the SDF forces from certain areas on mm -hmm. the borders. I mean, we know that the vision, actually, uh, of the administration, even though to some people it's very unrealistic, and you've mentioned Bilal in the beginning, that it would be the ideal situation if the SDF areas could sell oil or other things to Turkey. That would be the natural market. This is a vision that the administration yeah. has yeah. on that. How realistic is that, knowing that now they are creating these safe zones? And what does that cause the American SDF relationship? I mean, is there a strain on the relationship because of these new steps taken by the administration with the Turkish government? I haven't heard any as the uh, resentment about the safe zone. Mm -hmm. In fact, they see it as the lesser of two evils, the mm -hmm. larger evil being a Turkish incursion, which you know the Turkish government constantly threatens that it will do. Mm -hmm. And that's not just an empty threat. I think the SDF takes it very seriously, uh, given the, uh, the, the right political reading of what goes on inside Turkey, you know, the ruling party, the AKP, uh, is on shakier grounds than ever mm -hmm. uh, since it came to power. Uh, it's alliance right now with the MHP, which is a very right-wing anti-Kurdish mm -hmm. political party. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously they also lost in the last municipal elections in mm -hmm. part uh, because of uh, you know, the, the rising role of HDP, which is the pro-Kurdish uh, party inside Turkey on one hand, mm -hmm. but also a rising resentment inside the Turkish public against the Syrian refugees and uh, Turkey's uh, open-door policy. There are some 3.6 mm -hmm. million Syrian refugees that live in Turkey. Mm -hmm. So and against threat, Erdogan, I mean, against, and against the Erdogan, Erdogan and, and, and the, the role, economy obviously. and all of yeah. And the economy was definitely part of it. So yes. uh, the safe zone obviously uh, helps the SDF by uh, you know avoiding a Turkish military incursion. Mm -hmm. And again, that's also not a theory because mm -hmm. they saw that in Afrin and they saw that when it happened, no one came to the rescue. Mm -hmm. So they take that threat very seriously. It also helps Turkey by having a, a zone in which some of the refugees that live in Syria and creates mm -hmm. political uh, headache for the ruling party to be, you know, brought back into Syria. Mm -hmm. So that is the evil that they're trying to avoid. For the United States, obviously, uh, they don't want to come in line of fire in a war between uh, Turkey and, and the SDF. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, Russia is also playing an important role here. We heard today that... Uh, uh, Russian President Putin uh, told uh, his, his visiting Turkish president in, in Moscow that he, he welcomes and he, pre, he recognizes the security threats uh, that, uh, that they feel. I think another point for Turkey here, and this is what my colleague uh, Sonar Chapte argues, uh, uh, that uh, weakening the SDF, weakening the YPG, might actually open the door for negotiations between PKK and the Turkish government, that peace process that started and then yes. ended. Because in part, empowering the SDF, mm -hmm. 
by the United States, which what started the souring of relationship between Ankara and Washington, mm -hmm. D.C., in a way also empowered the PKK to restart its military activities against the Turkish government. Mm -hmm. If, according to uh, Senator's argument, if the YPG is seen as weaker or at least isolated as a threat uh, mm -hmm. to Turkey, then that will at least push the PKK Ankara peace negotiations to perhaps restart. Mm -hmm. And if that problem is solved, if the PKK Ankara problem is solved, then Ankara doesn't really have a problem with the YPG. Yes. The source of the problem with the YPG is, is the, the YPG PKK angle. <laughs> yes. So address the mothership. I think this yes. is kind of becomes a sideshow because even security wise, uh, the Turkish border with the SDF controlled areas is Turkey's safest border with Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, it has not been used as a launching ground for attacks against, um, uh, against mm -hmm. Turkey. And in fact, uh, Turkey has also shown this pragmatism in the past. Mm -hmm. I mean, the same relationship that they have today with the YPG, they used to have it with the KRG. Uh, yes. I usually tell the story, I crossed the Turkish border once mm -hmm. and they looked at all of my luggage, they saw a small like a jacket pin of a Kurdish flag. Yeah. They threw it in the trash can. They said, now you're free to go into Turkey. Yes. That was in the, in the early 2000s. Yes. And then fast forward, there is a Turkish flag in the Republican palace when uh, President Barzani of Kayarji goes and visits Ankara. Yes, there's So a that kind yes. of transformation and evolution is possible. That was actually the case uh, between YPG and, uh, and the Turkish government before mm -hmm. the United States supported the SDF. Saleh Muslim used to come and visit us at the American University of Iraq. Yes. He would fly through uh, Ankara. I yes. was uh, at a panel in which many of today who, ha who are on the Turkish hit list were actually speaking at panels at uh, public universities in, in Istanbul. Uh -huh. That relationship used to be quite positive. Yes. It went sour. Uh -huh. So if something that is sweet can go sour, it probably can go sweet again. Exactly. What uh, do you I would just say, add? Yes, Andrew. it seems like a distant memory now that Erdogan yeah. has led peace talks before much earlier in his career. Uh, while I think it's implausible that there is the kind of deep integration between eastern Syria and, and Turkey on the energy front in the near term, mm -hmm. um, the U.S. has already established a joint command center with the Turkish military. They are apparently planning to do joint patrols. If somewhere down the line there is a real track record of Turkey not going farther south and the SDF mm -hmm. and YPG staying at bay, it might be the kind of building block trust-wise that could be used to expand the relationship. And I think Turkey, especially given some of the economic problems that you've referenced before, um, may look favorably on the idea of having cheap energy on its doorstep and may not want to become entirely dependent on Russia, especially as it complies with uh, U.S. sanction policy towards Iran. Turkey has not been able to depend on Iran for oil because of the sanction policy. And mm -hmm. so the idea of using uh, oil currently controlled by the SDF to help lower energy prices and support the construction sector and so forth. You can see how maybe if the security question can be at least de-emphasized or perhaps even resolved to some extent as referenced, um, there's the beginnings of what could be a very interesting set of common interests between um, the SDF in eastern Syria and Ankara. Well, we'll be waiting to see all of these developments, but thank you so much for this great discussion. I would love to have you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. That was it for tonight's episode. Thank you for watching us. Good night.